welcome to Linux Action News, our weekly take on Linux and the open source world. This is episode 95, recorded on March 3rd, 2019. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. Good to be connected with you. Well, the elephant in the room this week, it's Mobile World Congress week, but I think we've done a pretty good job of sifting through some of the non-obvious stories. I don't see a single foldable screen story or crazy battery phone story in here. It's it's, uh, more of our speed, isn't it, Joe? Yes, it is. And let's start with the release of Lineage OS 16.0. Yeah, goodbye to Lineage 14.1 and hello Lineage 16.0, which is based on Android 9, which is Android Pie. And I think that came out in August. Yeah, development seems to be speeding up a bit. They've laid the groundwork with 15.1 to make these releases more timely and more in keeping with the release schedule of the Android upstream. You kind of mentioned the end of 14.1. That makes me sad. So... And I will talk about that in a bit, maybe. But let's talk about the positive side of it first. I flashed this on a OnePlus One, and it's great. It's stable, fast, just works exactly how you'd want the Ninja OS to work. Oh, interesting. Well, the initial devices supported isn't a ton. I mean, it's growing now, but I guess that makes two devices on this list I see that you have. Yeah, I've also got the OnePlus 3T, which is my daily driver phone, my main phone. And although I could have upgraded it, I don't want to take the risk yet. I need to set aside a good day where I can do it because if something goes wrong, then I'm just without a phone and that would just be a nightmare scenario for me. So thankfully, having another device on the list, the OnePlus One, means that I can try it out on that. And it has really reminded me that apart from the fact that my battery was basically dead and then in trying to do it, I managed to snap off the Wi-Fi antenna, making the phone pretty much useless, it is actually a great phone. And with Lineage on it, you can get a completely up-to-date phone that has got all the secure updates, runs like a dream, and you could pick one of these up so cheap now. It is a nice reminder that Android is actually an open source project. You guys out there that aren't uh, in the Google Denialist Club, uh, like Joe, might not remember, but Lineage OS is the successor of CyanogenMod, which ended in late 2016. Now, XDA reports that Lineage OS, as of 2018, had almost 1.8 million active installs. That's pretty great. I tease. I feel like people who install these ROMs are a bit, um, they're like that dog that's sitting in a room that's on fire saying this is fine while they're out there <laughs> buying these products. That's how I sort of feel like you're that guy. But I, at the same time, if I had a device like this, or if I needed something that was an Android-based app but wasn't comfortable with Google's version of Android, I can see the appeal. But in 2019, it it seems like it's getting to be a harder and harder sell to end users. Yeah, I can see that. And it's certainly not for everyone running custom ROMs on their phone. But it is for me. I like the customization. That's why I love Android, because you can customize it. And for all the things that iOS does well, customization isn't one of them. And that's among the many reasons that I don't use it. But of course, Lineage OS is not the only custom ROM out there. But it is the biggest one. As you said, a huge install base. It's almost mainstream, as close to mainstream as you can get with custom ROMs. And so them ending development of 14.1 is quite sad to me. Because although, yes, there will be other custom ROMs for devices that have now been effectively abandoned, Lineage is just the mainstream and my go-to because it just works really well and I know that I can trust it. So now there's tons of old phones like my wife's Nexus 5, which are not going to get security updates anymore unless I go for an unofficial version or a different ROM, which I could do and I probably will do. But it's just sad to me that I've now got several devices which are not supported anymore officially by Lineage. And so it's it's bittersweet, this. I suppose it was a bit inevitable, but I do think every time we talk about Lineage, you kind of start to change my mind and make me want to try it out. So, <laughs> you, you, okay, I, I'm, I'm coming around to your way of seeing it. Yeah, well, you've got devices. Um, have you got a 6P that you could flash it on, maybe? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've got a Pixel 3 and a 6P. Those are my most modern. And then I've got like an old uh, Nexus 5 or 5X. I think it's just the 5 banging around in a drawer somewhere. Yeah, I mean, you can flash the Google apps on it and get a very similar experience, or you can go the other way and just leave it without. And from what I've heard, the battery life is absolutely amazing if you don't flash the Google apps. You don't get stuff like play services, which are just running in the background, draining your battery. 
Yeah, you don't get a lot of functionality in apps, but I did do that experiment and can confirm. I think I added like two days to my battery life at least. But you know, if I'm if I'm if I'm trying to avoid Google or I want to get uh, more value out of my phone, honestly, if I wasn't looking at an iPhone these days, I'd seriously be tempted by one of these KaiOS phones. And that's that's one of our other mobile stories that we have this week that I didn't see a lot of coverage on, so I'm glad you found this one. The KaiOS folks are reporting they now have 85 million feature phones shipped running their Linux-based OS. Yeah, this is a continuation of Firefox OS, of course, which is long dead, but does live on in this form. And it's not designed to be running on smartphones, but then it's kind of bridging the gap between the real dumb phones, the kind of candy bar phones, and smartphones. It's it's trying to sit within that niche, which makes it absolutely ideal for a lot of developing markets. So India is one of the big markets for it. But um, all being well, one of these may well be landing on my doorstep this coming week. Oh, you ordered one? Yeah, the Nokia banana phone. How much was it? I paid 30 quid for it, I think. And that's the thing about these phones, is they range from about 20-something US dollars to about 30 to 40-something US dollars. And uh, that includes things with LTE and whatnot. Like, it's not horrible. They are really focused with KaiOS on the non-touch feature phone segment. So like Joe said, it's it's a lot like phones that uh, I initially had before smartphones were a thing, like some of my favorite Nokia phones and my Sony Ericsson phone. It looks a lot like those. In fact, the nostalgia factor is very high. I looked up some of these phones to see the pricing and honestly kind of want one because I could see getting some basic functionality. I'm still reachable by my family, but I don't have Twitter. I don't have Telegram. I don't have iMessage or WhatsApp or whatever it might be. It's, it's just a simple phone. But that's not been very true for a while. In fact, months ago, we reported on Google doing a deal to land some of their services on there. WhatsApp has an app, and I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see Telegram and a bunch of other things landing on these quote-unquote feature phones. Because according to the KaiOS folks, consumers in these markets, which is predominantly North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, want something that's less expensive than a smartphone, but they want it loaded with almost all the same features as a smartphone. Yeah, including a voice assistant, which seems like a very strange thing to have on a low-end feature phone to me. It means that all the processing is going to have to be in the cloud. It's almost just a dumb terminal at that point, isn't it? You can't expect it to do any offline processing, which means potentially high data usage and stuff. Although I suppose it'll be optimized, but still, it just seems like a strange fit for me. Smartphones, it makes a lot more sense, but these kind of bridge phones, I don't know, really. Yeah, and they're all HTML5 apps, too, so they're not going to be that great. But that's what consumers want, at least according to David Bang. He's the vice president of marketing and business development for KaiOS in North America. He also mentions, by the way, that these are getting traction in North America. They've sold 500,000 units to AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile, which is not bad. And the other app that's landing on this thing which think about this, is YouTube. All over the world now, even on $20 phones, YouTube will be available. It's, I mean, YouTube is so locked in as our video platform forever. I just can't see something like PeerTube or any other open source competitor coming along and ever knocking it off its throne, especially with the reach of Google, who can write $20 million checks to KaiOS and have them include the YouTube app. I don't know, this comments thing might take them down, but mm, probably not. <laughs> Could you imagine leaving a comment on a feature phone that doesn't have a keyboard so you'd have to, like, type it out using that old T9 (laughs) recognition? (laughs) Well, I'm looking forward to trying out WhatsApp with the T9 thing. I don't know if it'll be like riding a bike. Will it just come straight back to me? Maybe. Maybe you'll find it's faster, actually. Who knows? I, I think there's some people that think that. I think a lot of people think that until they actually try it, and then they realize, no, actually, a proper QWERTY keyboard, even on screen, is going to be faster than T9. But I was pretty good at it back in the day. I'll have to report back once I've got my hands on this thing. Yeah, I will be interested to know what you think about it. I I wouldn't be that surprised if you switch to it as your main phone. I I could see you doing that, Joe. I could not see me doing that. I could see myself (laughs) selling it very shortly after trying it out, but we'll see. Yeah, I think so. Well, uh, because you uh, you want to be on Android, right? I mean... Android's going to do away with passwords, Joe, for a billion users. Yeah, that's the promise. Now that Android is FIDO2 certified, FIDO standing for Fast Identity Online, 
And the promise is that with things like a fingerprint reader or possibly a hardware dongle like a YubiKey, you'll be able to have completely passwordless logins to a lot of websites in the browser. I bet there's a lot of people skeptical of something like this. So this is the FIDO Alliance. It's a consortium of PayPal, Google, Microsoft, Intel, Visa, RSA, Ubico is in there. A whole bunch of companies are in there. Like all of the major banks are in there too. Um, and their core mission is to develop a set of standards around authentication for apps and web applications that doesn't require the credentials to be stored on the services systems. Uh, they point to a data point that was collected by Verizon Security. Yeah, the Verizon company. They have a security arm. They say that 81% of data breaches in 2016 were caused by stolen or weak password credentials. 81% of data breaches in 2016, they say. And the issue seems to have just gotten worse over the years. Uh, that's just when they did their study. Um, so with these standards, the idea is the end user can use whatever verification mechanism they have. Like Joe said, maybe it's your fingerprint on your mobile device or a biometric device that's attached to your computer or a Yubico key. It, it does that locally. It verifies it and then sends a hash off to the remote service, logs you in. They never store your credentials, which seems very appealing. And they have various demos on YouTube where you can see this happen. And you mentioned a billion devices. The reason that it's so many is that it's going to be supported on Android 7 or later, and you're not going to have to get a software update for this. It's going to be delivered via the Google Play services updates, which is the argument that Google would make for running that proprietary stuff on top of the open source base. And I suppose it's a reasonable one, isn't it, that if they can deliver major features like this to people who are never going to get an update otherwise, maybe you can kind of see their point of view. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what the, the Google Play services and all of that came around, so that way they could have a, a base that app vendors could rely upon that could be portable between versions of Android. And there's reason why they've baked everything in that, from location to payment processing, and now authentication. FIDO Alliance seems to be getting a lot of support. It's a little fuzzy on how far, like Safari and, and the iOS devices are going to go with their support, but besides Apple... Adoption by Firefox and Chrome is, is in. It's solid. Microsoft's on board. You can log into Azure right now with Fido Auth. So it's it's getting more and more industry adoption. Um, you can find some videos on YouTube from FOSDEM 2018 called Breaking Fido, which has a great overview of its security architecture. The thing is, though, I asked a web dev who does a lot of mobile stuff whether he was going to be implementing this for clients, and he'd never heard of it. So it's not a good sign to me that we're going to get widespread adoption quickly. I mean, that's only a sample size of one, so obviously take it with a pinch of salt. But I don't think that it's widely known about, really, even within the industry. I think it's going to take months or even years, really, before it's just a standard thing. Yeah, I, absolutely. Although it does start with the platform adding support. So the Google Play API or your web browser or whatever the platform is, they have to bake it in there so then developers can take advantage of it. And that's the step we're at right now, is they're baking it in at the platform level still. Yeah. I just wish that the Google Play Services stuff was open source. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but imagine if it did. That would be so awesome for the platform to be completely open source. But I don't know, maybe I'm dreaming again. Maybe, Joe. Although people one day would have told you a totally open source CPU architecture was impossible. And we know that's not true. Yeah, Risk Five's back in the news this week with a few different stories, actually. The first one being that support has been added to the Grub bootloader for it. Yes, yeah, just in the last few Git commits as we record this episode, Risk Five support has been merged, and it ended up just being about a mere 400 new lines of code. Not too bad. Yeah, it is, and it's a pretty big step towards making Risk Five a mainstream platform running GNU slash Linux. So, yeah, it's very good to see. But another one is that RISC-V support has been added to the free RTOS kernel by Amazon. Well, you know, this story actually made me think you're onto something, Joe, with all this RISC-V stuff. Because if Amazon's willing to throw in like this, uh, you might be onto something. After that Linus article, I was starting to think maybe, maybe we were uh, dreaming with this. But they're contributing in se several significant ways to free RTOS, which is a popular operating system designed for little itty-bitty, small, simple 
application processors, like little microcontrollers that are involved with something, maybe like opening a valve, or it could be all kinds of things. Maybe maybe they even connect to a board that syncs to a system over Bluetooth, low energy, or Wi-Fi, or even a serial connection. It's It varies a lot. And at first, I couldn't really see the connection. AWS, Amazon, and these tiny little microprocessors in built into embedded systems? Like, what, what was the connection? Well, these little IoT devices on the edge have to report back to a server somewhere, and where better than AWS, eh? Yeah, I just always thought maybe that was a myth. <laughs> like, why would you take something that is perfectly secure and connect it to the internet? That just seems like a bad idea. But Amazon clearly sees demand here, and on the free RTOS website, they have a I guess they call it an Amazon FAQ. We'll have a link in the show notes. And they write here that device manufacturers are connecting their MCU-based devices to the cloud to innovate both their products and their business models. However, it takes time to build the security and connectivity components necessary for this connectivity into the device's software. A significant portion of these connected MCU devices are already running on a free RTOS kernel. So Amazon figured... To speed up adoption of AWS services with these devices, they'd provide the free RTOS project with the resources necessary to extend their offering, fully integrate security and connectivity libraries, and ensure those libraries are developed and maintained in the long term, which is an improvement for the entire project, not just on Amazon services or for Amazon's customers, but for everybody using free RTOS. It's sort of best case for an open source project. And this just makes so much sense for RISC-V to be deployed in these really low power devices, rather than the dream of a free software running laptop with RISC-V at the heart of it. That's so far off at this point. We need to get the adoption first in these kind of edge devices, and then maybe they'll develop to the point where we can do some serious computing on them. Well, I don't know, maybe it just means they're gonna be kind of put into this niche and stay there. But then you could argue that happened with ARM first. That was embedded systems. And now we're starting to get servers and starting to get laptops running ARM. So I'm going to try and look on the bright side here, I think. I think it has a good shot. I think that is a there's a good shot of that happening. And the secret sauce here for RISC-V is that it is open source. So there's more potential for more different types of devices to get built where they don't have to go to ARM and spend an arm and a leg to license. <laughs> well, the other side of risk 5 being an open instruction set architecture is that you can build on top of that by adding proprietary bits. And that's what we've seen from Greenwaves who are using risk 5 to create AI capable chips, which is good that it is kind of driving more adoption of risk 5, but it's showing that other side of it that it's not just this free software utopia. There are strong commercial reasons for this. It means that people can take that instruction set architecture and make chips much more affordably than using something like ARM. Right. It's part of the puzzle piece. It's not a full puzzle. The other piece is, like in the case of this Greenwave company, they're what's known as a fabless chip maker, (laughs) which means that they design chip architectures, and then it builds them by outsourcing to a hardware manufacturer, And then GreenWave builds on top of that their proprietary application layer and their special sauce. Um, But it means that they get at that a lot faster than if they had to build a microprocessor from the ground up or license something from ARM and have that assembled. So it's part of a puzzle. It's maybe a bit akin to how Linux is on Android handsets, but what the end user interfaces with isn't open source. Yeah, that is a reasonable analogy, but um, I suppose that's enough mobile and embedded stuff. Let's talk about some good old-fashioned desktop GNU slash Linux. Yeah, us Linux users were warned this week about the dangers of Thunderbolt with the Thunderclap vulnerability. I imagine it has, like, some sort of echo effect and, like, a thundering in the background. I mean, it's pretty scary. Yeah, I don't really understand why this is news. There's only a few details of it, really, that make it news because we've known for a long time that there's an inherent vulnerability in Thunderbolt. Anyone with physical access to your device can basically take it over. The reason that Thunderbolt is so fast is because it has direct access to the hardware. Yeah, it's it's on the PCI Express bus. It is the same level of vulnerability as if somebody opened up a PC case and installed a PC card into the PCI bus. So that's that's 
kind of what makes Thunderbolt great, but that's also what makes it a little dangerous. And Linux actually has protections for that. But I'll tell you, I did some digging. I figured out why this is news, because how they did it is super cool. And I think that's part of what's getting it spread around. So some researchers presented a new set of vulnerabilities with Thunderbolt in a new kind of um, unique way to exploit these issues where the authors built a fake network card and then performed various direct memory attacks. And here's how they built this network card. It's so cool. They write, we extracted a software model of an Intel E1000 from a QMU full system emulator. We then ran it on an FPGA board. And then they have more details on their GitHub. So they they took this, this model of an Intel E1000 from QMU and then emulated it on an FPGA with a Thunderbolt port and then were able to connect it to a Thunderbolt port on a machine and the system thought it was talking to a network card, so it granted it access to the PCI bus. It's not really surprising. This is how it works, and that's why Linux has Bolt. Bolt is a security mechanism for Thunderbolt where you can allow devices access or not. Yeah, and let's not forget that what they made here actually does function as a network card. And that's kind of the point that they're making. If you go to a conference and plug a projector into your USB-C port that is Thunderbolt, then it may still work as a projector, but it could also be doing loads of nefarious stuff. Yeah, I think anytime you're plugging anything into your machine, even if it's USB, uh, you, you need to be careful. So there's there's a primary defense against these DMA attacks for Thunderbolt 3, and there are three different security levels. If they're enabled and they're turned on by default in the BIOS on most systems, it gives the software the ability on your computer to decide on a per-device level to allow any PCIe tunnels or not. Uh, while not protecting you from all of the attacks, this is like the most common physical attacks that we keep talking about where somebody walks up and plugs in. And I think this is where some of the confusion is coming in and maybe some of the newsworthiness is the paper, maybe just as a result of like the review process or whatever, uh, states that the situation for Linux is that patches for approval of hot plug devices have been produced by Intel and distributions are beginning to implement user interfaces. But that's actually not true. The the user interface is baked into GNOME now. Plasma is getting one. There's also the Bolt-D command line that exists already. And kernel-level support landed in kernel 4.13. So that's RHEL 7.6, for example, already has this. And that's an enterprise-grade distro. Um, So the paper kind of misstates that just simply because I think of the review process timeline. And that also caused some news sites to misreport that Linux was actually vulnerable to this. It's vulnerable, but it has the mitigations. Well, jokes on everyone else. I've got the ultimate mitigation. My laptop doesn't have Thunderbolt. <laughs> oh, very savvy, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I deliberately did that. It's not because I don't need external graphics or anything. No. And USB-C is fast enough for storage for a laptop, I think. And my desktop as well doesn't have Thunderbolt. I don't really understand why desktops would have Thunderbolt when they've got PCIe slots, but... I suppose maybe you want multiple devices or whatever. There are some really fast external storage arrays that are like all MVNE disks in a tower that come back over Thunderbolt, and it's mind-blowing fast. Yeah, you can have multiple displays and stuff like that. So I can see there are definitely advantages there. But Mm -hmm. again, with this physical access thing as well, that's really what we're talking about here. You have to have physical access to the device to be able to do anything nefarious. and. Isn't that the first rule of computing? If you've got physical access, then you can do whatever you want with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. If I if I get to somebody's computer, I'm way more likely to go after single user mode than I am yeah, the Thunderbolt exactly. port. <laughs> exactly. But I think it's more about hidden uses, isn't it? Like projectors and chargers. And that's one of the big bits of advice is don't charge your laptop via the Thunderbolt port if it's a charger you don't trust. Just use one of the non-Thunderbolt ports, which most laptops do, don't they? They have a kind of just just a USB-C port. Yeah, not MacBooks. MacBooks, um, I think, are all USB-C Thunderbolt 3, um, except for maybe like one of the models. But you're right, like my ThinkPad has a different port for charging and a different port for Thunderbolt. But I wonder if the, the next phase of this attack, the one that I think would be legitimately newsworthy, would be if they could compromise the firmware of a, of a common dongle something that you do see like in the corporate work environment or at a, at a presenter's booth. These, some of these dongles, like some of Apple's dongles that do video out over USB-C 
actually are running a mini OS on them doing video decoding on chip inside the dongle. Inside the dongle, there's a mini computer in there. So if you could compromise something like that, which would be a trusted device, and deliver some kind of payload, or, or even just read memory and dump it to a chip, uh, that, I think, would be a real news story. Yeah, I could definitely see that happening. Well, something else that we saw coming was the end of the Corora project, a beloved respin of Fedora Desktop. Yeah, beloved by me as well. Now, Fedora, don't get me wrong, is a great distro, but Corora just built on top of that and just made it so easy to do so many things and just made it a more polished, better experience. And so 10 months ago when they said that it was looking like there weren't going to be any updates in the near future, I was pretty sad about that. And then this week they've tweeted to say that's it. Their website's now redirecting to getfedora.org. And so that's it. Rest in peace. Yeah, I agree with listener X Metal. He wrote, Corora was always that, oh, that's how I set up Fedora Distro. And I, I often would install it, look around and go, okay, next time I load Fedora, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit like this. Um, plus also for those of us that loved a KDE spin. This was a great way to go. So they made it a good 13 years. And Fedora of today is really different than it was 13 years ago. I'm running it right now on a ThinkPad. And I'm running Telegram. I'm running Slack. I've got Chrome on there. I mean, I've got all of the negative in the Freedom Dimension apps. And it it was pretty simple to get going. But on top of that, I've got just a ton of new apps that I've installed from GNOME Software because... GNOME software is actually getting pretty usable. And I have a new firmware update that I just installed on my machine. Like, it's feeling like a first-class desktop experience now. And the availability of software is just check boxes away and maybe one repo ad and you're set. It's, it's a totally different user experience now. And GNOME is in a totally different state than it was 13 years ago. So it's, it's maybe time. Yeah, I was going to say that as well, that Fedora has come a long way. And I don't know, has it maybe taken influence from Corora? Or maybe it's just gone that way anyway. But it does seem a lot more user-friendly now to add codecs and get the proprietary stuff. They're sort of less locked down about that stuff now. And so maybe Corora was becoming less relevant anyway. So although it will be missed, it's maybe not going to be as missed as it could have been had this happened, say, five years ago. As someone who was kind of a skeptic for a while, and I'm now following Fedora with quite a bit of interest, I have a server installation and now a desktop installation. Uh, I, I like the direction they're going. I don't know, a little birdie tells me we'll probably be hearing more about Fedora on future Choose Linux episodes too. Yeah, it won the vote for Jason's next community distro challenge, so it looks like I'll be installing it. I think he'll be doing a second vote for which spin of Fedora, which desktop, and I'm hoping that GNOME doesn't win. Come on, XFCE for the win. Oh, yeah, dream on, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it looks like I'll be checking out GNOME very soon. Well, in the meantime, this show comes out every single Monday. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And go to linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. And if you're going to scale this coming weekend, I'll be there and we're having a meetup, meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. For those details, we're having a dinner. Elle's having a talk. There's a lot going on at scale this year. We'd love to say hi. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting for that and a bunch of other events we've got going on. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. I'm at Chris LAS. I'm at Joe Ressington. Thank you for joining us and I'll see you at scale. See you later. (laughs) 